today's market is tough for home buyers. So let's talk about making your offer stand out. Hi, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Samantha Perlman and I'm a realtor located in central New Jersey. So let's face it, the market is tough out there for home buyers. It's fantastic for home sellers, lots of buyers to pick from, but if you're a buyer out there, if you're already in the market and you've been shopping around, you already know what's happening. You are going up against so many qualified buyers all for the same properties. In fact, I just submitted an offer for a client this weekend and we're one of six. I just put up a new listing, we're one of eight, and I actually had a client last week go up against 22 other offers. If a home is priced right and shows well, it is getting multiple offers. So you as a buyer are experiencing the dreaded bidding war. So I get asked a very common question in these situations for my buyers when they're going up against multiple offers, and I did address this in last week's video, but it's the question of, well, what are the other offers on the table? So I'm just gonna lay it out there and just let you know that we have no idea. When there are other offers on the table, we have no idea what those offers look like. We don't know if they're under asking, above, at, we don't know if they're conventional, FHA, down payments, we don't know any of that information. Quite frankly, the listing agent doesn't have to tell us anything. So what we need to do is when we submit an offer, we need to focus on making your offer as the buyer the strongest and best it can absolutely be. So in this week's video, I've actually got 10 different ways that you can make your offer stand out. Now, I'm certainly not saying do all 10 of these on your offer, but we're gonna break them all down and then you can pick and choose which ones might work for you in your market and your situation. So let's get started. Number one, have your buyer's agent reach out to the listing agent and try to gather some information. Like I said a few minutes ago, I mean, the listing agent really isn't under any obligation to tell us anything. They don't have to tell us anything about the offers. They don't have to tell us anything about the seller. They're really not under any obligation. But whenever I represent a buyer, I always try to see what they are willing to share. And then we use that to our advantage if we can. So let me give you an example. If there's a specific closing date that the seller really needs, let's say they need something really fast because the property is vacant or on the other side, maybe they haven't found their next house and they really need somebody who's got a flexible closing date who can give them a little bit more time. I like to find that information out ahead of time because if this is something that my buyer can accommodate, then we wanna use that to our advantage to make our offer stand out. So if the seller needs a quick closing and we can accommodate that, well, I always make sure to point that out when we're submitting our offer. Number two do not come in with a low price offer. If you're in the market that we're in right now, where things are selling within hours and days, and they're going for multiple offers, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 offers on a house, there is no possible way that that house is gonna sell for below list price. So by you submitting a below list price offer, you're pretty much guaranteed not to win the deal. And I, I hate to say that because I really do thoroughly enjoy negotiating for my clients and getting them the lowest price possible, but it's also important to understand what's happening in the local market and partner with a local real estate professional that is knowledgeable in what's happening in the market. And instead of having the conversation of how low below list can we get it for, the conversation really needs to be, well, how high above list price are properties typically selling for right now? Because the chances are, depending on the situation, the price point, the neighborhood, the market, and how many offers are on the table, you can pretty much guarantee it's gonna sell for above list price. I'm gonna sidebar for a second and share one other quick tip that I do give with my buyers right now. Um, I always tell them that you really in this market should be shopping a little bit below your max budget price. So for example, if your max budget is 450,000, you don't wanna be looking at brand new listings, beautiful listings that just hit the market right at your 450 max. Because if they get multiple offers and they go above asking, well, you're not gonna be able to bid that high. So what I always tell them is go a little bit below. Maybe we look at things at 410, 420. That way you've got some wiggle room in your budget if you have to go over list price in your offer that it's still gonna fall within your budget. Number three write a personal letter to the seller. Now this is a little controversial because not all listing agents love this idea of a seller letter. Um, some listing agents actually look at it as a little bit of a liability for the seller. But when I represent the buyer, I always encourage it because in my opinion, it can never hurt. Basically what this is, is this is gonna be a personal letter from you as the buyer that you're writing direct to the seller. You're gonna be talking about things like why this house is such a great fit and why they should pick you as a buyer. In fact, stay tuned for next week's video where I'm actually gonna break down the general format I suggest to my buyers for the seller letter, so keep an eye out for that. Now the letter doesn't always work and the seller doesn't always have to read them, but it doesn't hurt. Number four, agree to take the property as is. 
Now, technically, all resale properties in the state of New Jersey are as is, subject to the buyer's rights to do a home inspection and subject to the seller's rights to cure any defects found by the buyer. However, advertising and agreeing to take the property as is up front to the seller, you're essentially telling them that you're not going to nickel and dime them come home inspection time. What we're finding in this market, what's happening is buyers are bidding really, really high because they want to win the deal. And then they use the home inspection to really beat up the seller and negotiate the price back down to where they wanted it to be in the beginning. And sellers are becoming very savvy and weary of this. So by you advertising that you're willing to take the property as is, now, of course, you're still going to do a home inspection as a buyer because that's your right. But basically, you're telling them unless something major comes up, you're not going to be asking for the seller to fix anything. And of course, you can waive the home inspection if you want and not even do one. And the sellers probably are going to love that. But you can still do one and agree to take the property as is. Now, using this strategy of either waiving the inspection or agreeing to take the property as is, I don't suggest for everybody. I suggest this more for buyers that have either owned homes before or you're very handy and hands-on. Or if you plan on renovating the property anyway and putting a lot of money into changing it, well, then the home inspection may not be as important. However, if you're a first time home buyer out there and maybe you're not that handy and that makes you a little bit nervous of waiving the home inspection, one of the things you can do is set a limit on home inspection. And what I mean by that is we'll set a limit, let's say, you know, $5,000 and that you reserve the right to do the home inspection and that you're not going to ask for any repairs from the seller unless that cost of repair exceeds that threshold that you've set. Let's say 5,000 or a thousand or whatever is your comfort level. That really, again, tells the seller that you're not going to nickel and dine them on 50, hundred dollar repairs here and there. You really only reserve the right to have a conversation around large ticket items. This is something that could be very appealing to a seller. Number five, waiving the appraisal. Now this is another one that may not be for everybody, but I want you all to know what your options are out there as a buyer. So what's happening right now, because the market is so crazy and there's so much demand and not enough supply and it's driving prices up, there's a lot of concerns around whether or not a home will actually appraise. So for example, if a house goes on the market at 350,000 and the market supports a $350,000 price and it gets multiple offers and the buyer's bid as high as, I don't know, let's say 400,000, well, you still have to make sure that the property can appraise for that 400,000 if there's getting financing on it. If you as a buyer are paying cash, this is sort of irrelevant. So we're just focusing on anybody that's getting financing. So by you using the term waive the appraisal in your offer, it doesn't mean that you're actually going to eliminate the appraisal because your bank and lender is going to require it. That's how they protect their investment. Essentially, what you're telling the seller is if for any reason the property under appraises, you're ready, willing, and able to make up the difference in cash. So let me go back to the example I gave you. We went on the market 350, the winning offer was 400, and let's say that the property only appraised at $380,000. Well, that's a $20,000 difference. By you stating you're waiving the appraisal, you're already agreeing that you're willing to make up that extra $20,000 in cash so that your mortgage doesn't get jeopardized and the seller still gets the $400,000 that you promised them. Now, again, this isn't gonna work for everybody. You have to have extra cash on hand and you have to be willing to pay an above appraised value for a property. So this really is a decision that only you can make. You can also set a limit to it and instead of leaving it open-ended like that, you can say something like you're willing to make up at least $10,000 in appraised value if there's any discrepancy. So for example, in that situation that we just talked about, it appraised at 380, you would be willing to pay an extra 10,000 to bring it to 390, and then the seller would have to come down to the 390 to match that. Again, this is another situation where consult with your local real estate professional to understand how this decision can affect you in the long term. Number six, talk to your lender about conventional financing. So before I get into all of this, I just want to say I'm not a mortgage lender or a broker and that you should consult with your mortgage professional about all the different programs out there, how they affect you and what you qualify for. So for the sake of the conversation, I'm actually going to be looking at financing in three different categories. We're going to be looking at it conventional, FHA, and any of the 100% financing programs out there like USDA and VA. Now, if you're a seller out there and you receive multiple offers on your property, let's say you receive offers in all three of these categories, typically your conventional buyer is going to appear as your strongest buyer on paper. Conventional buyers typically have a larger down payment and they have an easier appraisal process. Your FHA buyers are typically only a three and a half percent down payment and they have a slightly stricter appraisal process. And then your 100% financing, well, they don't have any 
down payment. It's exactly like it sounds, it's 0% down. And they also have one of the most strict appraisal processes. So when I'm talking about, you know, appraisal process, I'm talking about, you know, more than just looking at the value of the property, they're actually gonna be looking at the conditional things on the property as well. So on paper, sellers typically love conventional buyers over the other two. So if you fall within the FHA or 100% financing category, but you actually can qualify for conventional financing, it might be worth going that route to make your offer stand out amongst the crowd. Now, of course, I might have some people out there that are upset by me suggesting this, and certainly I'm not saying don't utilize an FHA program or 100% financing program. In fact, the way my husband and I bought our house was through FHA, and it's a fantastic program out there. All I'm saying is that when you're competing against other offers, going conventional might give you a leg up. I will also say that just because somebody's conventional, that doesn't 100% guarantee you're making it to the closing table. I have had situations where people were conventional buyers and we didn't close. And we ended up closing with an FHA or VA buyer. So it certainly doesn't 100% guarantee anything. It's important that your listing agent, when they receive all the offers, they have conversations with all the lenders involved to really confirm that a proper pre-approval process was done on the buyer and they were fully vetted to make sure they're qualified. Number seven. Find out if your lender offers upfront underwriting and if they do, take advantage of it. Now, I'm not gonna talk about the pre-approval. I mean, I've got another video. We've talked about that down below in my face. You have to be pre-approved. You have to submit that along with your offer. But if your lender offers an even more thorough vetting process and they offer upfront underwriting, make sure that that is clearly communicated over to the listing agent when you submit your offer. That essentially makes you a stronger buyer. It means that the lender didn't just take, you know, an hour or two with you and look at a couple documents and give you a pre-approval. They actually took the time, energy, and effort to take all of your documents and send them through their underwriting team for a full vetting process. It makes you a stronger buyer and essentially says, assuming everything goes well with the appraisal, inspections, things like that, you're gonna be good to go to purchase the house. So if your lender has this, make sure you take advantage of it and it gets communicated over to the other side. Number eight, don't ask for a seller's concession. Okay, don't get mad at me. I know there's gonna be people out there that might be mad at me for saying this, but it is definitely something worth considering when you are competing out there. First, let me just say a seller's concession basically means you're offering one price and the seller's agreeing at closing to give you back a credit on some of those that money to be used towards your closing costs. A lot of buyers utilize this when, they, when they're buying the house. If they only have the money for the down payment and they don't necessarily have the money for the closing costs, they want to roll them into the loan. So for example, let's say they want to buy the house for 340000 and it's an estimate of about 10000 in closing costs. They'll actually offer 350000 with a $10,000 concession, and that $10,000 concession goes towards all of their closing costs. It's a great strategy for a lot of first-time home buyers out there. However, in a competitive market, asking for a seller's concession and basically advertising upfront that you don't have enough funds to close can be a red flag for the sellers. It means if there's any appraisal issues, if for any reason the property under appraises at all, let's say that same example, it only appraises at the 340,000, the seller would then have to agree to take 330,000, even $10,000 less than the appraised and 20,000 less than the agreed upon price, just so that you can get your closing costs covered. And most sellers are not gonna wanna do that. So if you have the money for your down payment and your, to cover your closing costs and you really don't need the seller's concession, consider waiving it in this situation because it could be the one thing that makes the seller move on to somebody else. Number nine, consider adding an escalation clause. Now I have used escalation clauses in the past pretty successfully for my buyers. And let me break it down exactly what that means for you. Let's say you're making an offer on a house for $320,000 and you've included an escalation clause in $1,000 increments up to a max price of $330,000. Basically what that means is you're offering $320,000, but if somebody else comes in and offers, let's say $325,000, your offer automatically gets bumped up by $1,000 to $326,000 and you beat them. But of course you've set the max price of $330,000, so it means that no matter what, you're never gonna go above that $330,000 price. So if somebody offers $329,000, you beat them at $330,000, but if they offer 330, you are already at your max, so you're not going to go to 331. Now, buyers love this because they feel like at least they're not spending more than they have to in order to win the deal. You know, they're only winning it by that thousand dollars, so they're only have spending an extra thousand. But sellers don't necessarily always love it because they look at it well, if you're willing to pay three hundred and thirty thousand dollars for the house, just pay three thirty and we'll take your offer. So it really just comes down to the mindset of the person sending and receiving it and how it's communicated to determine how well it's received. And again, talk to your real estate professional about all the pros and cons of this. Number 10, 
This is a pretty big one. Don't be late submitting your offer. <laughs> if there are multiple offers on the property and there's a highest and best or best and final deadline, get your offer in on time. It doesn't matter how great your offer is. If you don't have it in on time, the seller's not under any obligation to even review the offer on hand. So if you want a chance to go after this house, you have to get your offer in on time. If you haven't already done so, check out last week's video about all about highest and best. It's a pretty quick video. I just go over the definition of what it means, but I also share some advice on what I give my buyers when they're thinking about how high of a price they want to offer on the house. So go check that one out. And next week's video, I'm actually going to break down the generic format that I recommend to my buyers when they're writing a personal letter to the seller. A couple key important things that I think that they should make sure they always include in the letter. So keep an eye out for that. And of course, you know, I shared a lot of different things that you can do with your offer today. And, and as I said earlier, you probably don't want to put all of these things into your offer because it can become quite um, confusing and, and not well received on the other side. But a couple of these things really could make the difference in making your offer stand out. So make sure you talk with your real estate professional about the pros and cons of each and how you should structure the best offer you can when bidding on a house. Stay safe, everybody, and I'll see you next week.